Uh, thank you so much uh, to the organizers. Uh, I'm glad to be given an opportunity to participate. Uh, I'll try and look at this topic from different angles and I, I have no uh, conflicts of interest to declare. Uh, we will reflect on the recent statement uh, by the WHO and go through a little bit about, remind ourselves about the variants, how they emerge, uh, and the patterns of what we see in terms of convergent evolution uh, and, and a little bit about the impacts of these and, and hopefully uh, um, uh, provide some thoughts at the end of this talk. Uh, recently, uh, WHO released um, uh, a statement uh, which is very important to read it correctly. Uh, we see um, the WHO say the COVID-19 pandemic is over as a global health emergency. And I think it's very, very important that the, the pandemic is not over. Uh, and I quote a statement from uh, the, the Director General. He says, the worst thing uh, for any country it could do for now is to use this news as a reason to let down its guard, to dismantle the systems it has built and to send a message to the people that the COVID-19 is nothing to worry about. Uh, and in this meeting of the International Health Regulations um, uh, uh, on the 4th of May, some recommendations that came up very strongly is we need to utilize the information and, and the knowledge that we've gained in the past two, three years uh, to, to make sure that we diversify uh, um, our surveillance to multiple pathogens to make sure that we are prepared for any uh, eventuality as we know that uh, we experience uh, uh, climate changes and probably uh, climate amplified uh, uh, emergency, emerging diseases. So we need to continue to support and improve vaccines and to uh, that would reduce transmission uh, to have broad applicability uh, and to understand the full spectrum incidence and impact of post-COVID-19 condition. Uh, I missed an earlier uh, talk on long COVID, and I know that this is one of the passionate topics. And, 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 I, and I saw from the tweets that uh, it was done a good justice. So we need to, un to continue to monitor the evolution of the SARS-CoV-2, especially in immunocompromised populations, uh, and to develop uh, rec uh, 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 integrated pathways of care. So some of the, the, the statements that I would like to quote is COVID-19 has changed our world and it has changed us. Uh, and that's the, the new way it would be if we all go back to how things were before COVID-19 would have failed our lessons, uh, to learn our lessons and to have failed the future generations. Um, and one of the greatest strategies of COVID-19 is that uh, um, we know now by looking back that there are some things that would have done uh, differently. So in, as, a, as a reflection, as a scientist, uh, I thought I will look at, as we exit the exit mode, what is the trail of the virus as brought to our world? And as you can see, the global excess mortality uh, and this, um, this graph shows the distribution of mortality across the world. Uh, and you can see that, of course, the world were affected differently. And we can see as well that there's still unfinished business despite the global success in terms of vaccination. Uh, you can see this, um, uh, a cartogram at the bottom here. I hope you can see my slide, uh, my pointer very well. You can see uh, that our unvaccinated world on the left is mostly uh, countries uh, uh, in, in, in Africa and, and, and parts of Asia. Uh, and it confirms that the majority of the unvaccinated world lives in the developing world. Uh, and and we also know that the newer generational vaccines like uh, the bivalent uh, Omicron boosters 
while they were developed so fast with the information that a lot of people generated across the world, uh, to my last check, in terms of being available in Africa, it was only in clinical trials. Uh, despite uh, the efforts of many, of many uh, scientists to characterize and describe variants, uh, we still are, are falling behind. If you look at the graph on the right of your screen, you can see the red indicates that the boosters per 100 people, you can see that uh, uh, most of our, our continent is still on the red. Um, so that's an important reflection that we should make. Uh, because of that, the reason why I put it there is because uh, what drives uh, viral evolution uh, is also uh, probably going to be in a waning immunity. Uh, and we know that uh, variants image uh, in different uh, pathways. We have seen undetected evolution through person to person or genomic surveillance blind spot. If we, we, we will only maybe detect when it becomes uh, 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 um, highly transmissions, and then we see cases uh, rising up and would have missed there. That's uh, a surveillance uh, blind spot, emphasizing that while we have done well, uh, the cases are done well, most of us were eager to go back to our lives. We need to continue uh, to make sure we don't lose our guard in terms of, of genomic surveillance because it could help us to detect uh, variants early and look at their implications. Of course, we have seen a, a number of studies uh, that have shown that uh, chronic human uh, infection with uh, intra-host evolution, a couple of studies, uh, uh, all these three studies out of South Africa, showed us how an evolution of variants within individuals that were immunocompromised, and we could see mutations that were rising uh, uh, within host and individuals who have followed over time that had uh, um, uh, core infections that were giving uh, uh, immune suppression. Of course, uh, we also know that uh, reverse zoonosis is possible uh, and then evolution in animal reservoir and then spilling back to humans. Uh, recently, just off the press a week ago, uh, we, 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 we documented uh, and released uh, uh, data on, uh, uh, we isolated SARS-CoV-2 from a dog, uh, and we managed to characterize uh, showing um, this uh, dog, uh, the alert from the owners of the dog that the dog developed symptoms, uh, and we managed to isolate. Of course, this was during Delta. We managed to do this and, uh, and release the data to just indicate that there's still a potential uh, of uh, uh, zoonosis or reverse zoonosis and we should be watching out for this. So we, we, we know that we have experienced an unprecedented um, uh, uh, an unprecedented uh, uh, viral evolution uh, with SARS-CoV-2. So just to briefly look at that, we know that with other viruses such as influenza uh, 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 and HIV uh, routinely produce new variants because of the mutagenicity of the, or the errors during replication of the virus. Uh, the, the scarlet, which uh, SARS-CoV-2 has spun off new variants and lineages, appears to be unprecedented in modern uh, virology history. We have not seen such before. And we know that the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines reduce severe disease and mortality, uh, but do not confer enough immunity to prevent reinfection. So it means that you, you, you still get a low level of uh, viral replication uh, in vaccinated hosts. Uh, which is an important. So hence, we have an unusual situation uh, of viral replication uh, uh, in, in, in hosts where the immune system is placing an evolutionary pressure. Uh, we'll see in a couple of slides where we're experiencing some convergent evolution because of this uh, pressure that we have successfully uh, uh, induced, whether it's coming from a vaccine uh, acquired immunity or natural uh, infection, uh, acquired immunity. So we see that uh, we, 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 we will observe, uh, uh, we are observing uh, uh, changes, but also a necessary bottleneck for the virus, 
which is good, uh, and we need to keep uh, watching that very well. So whether this rapid evol uh, evolutionary trajectory is a result of uh, viral replication properties or replication in immune host or both is unknown, but the conditions present presented in the past year or two of the pandemic have produced uh, some kind of a natural experiment in viral evolution, uh, which cannot uh, 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 dissense uh, a real conclusion, but generates very good hypothesis for us to 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 learn from. Uh, so, uh, so we 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 see uh, what has happened throughout the world, uh, and of course, from the emergence of of Omicron, uh, we see that the spike protein residues that really emerged independently across variants. The position 417, 452, 484, and 681 became very important positions that all of us were watching with every sequence that came out. You uh, actually zoom in into those positions and see what is different uh, from there. And uh, uh, and since the late 2022 uh, and, and, and now in the third year of the, of the pandemic, we see the advent of Omicron and uh, the sub-lineages of Omicron. And we see that the observation that we see uh, in these, they are, they are adding uh, additional group of mutations uh, in different uh, amino acid reduces. And we see the key ones that I've written there, are the most important ones, for example, being 486. And these ones have properties that we have seen that they've, they have increased the fitness of the virus. But the good thing is that the transmissibility as well uh, uh, has also uh, uh, declined. So this is uh, what we see on the left side uh, is an unrooted phylogenetic tree of the Omicron subvariants along with uh, uh, the, 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 main, uh, the main variants uh, that we know. Uh, and we see the key mutations and we see that we, there is this rise of the Omicron family and uh, and uh, this rise of the family, uh, swamp of new subvariants that has risen is what is really been driving uh, uh, the current new infections. And the good thing is that uh, very very low in number, which is very very important. One of these that I spotlight is the XBB, uh, which is a recombinant or fusion of two of two uh, different BA uh, uh, variants. Uh, BJ1, so-called BA.2.10.1, uh, and the BA.2.75. And you can see that it's a recombinant uh, in terms of taking the pieces of, B of BJ.1 and the pieces of uh, BJ2.75 coming up with the XBB. Uh, and you can see that uh, if you look at the next uh, graph, you'll see that uh, uh, we're experiencing uh, small changes uh, within the XBB family, which is now driving most of the infections, uh, as you can see. And these are driven by antigenic change based on, on the selection for antibody evasion. So most of these are really arising because of the antibody evasion uh, with increase of vaccination. And the question one asks always is, could new variants emerge? Uh, there is no straight answer for that. But one, one good benefit that we see is that from chronic infections, we can see that uh, there's still um, a potential if we get T cell escape. But in terms of antibody evasion, uh, we are uh, approaching a bottleneck, which is very good. So we are generating uh, what someone called a variant soup. Uh, you can see uh, in, 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 in this um, uh, graphic that someone uh, did very well, and we can see that all these sub lineages are really accumulating uh, very, very uh, 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 minor changes. Uh, and, and that's what uh, we are calling convergent evolution in BA1, BA2, because uh, while they are evolu evolving separately, they are sometimes acquiring similar mutations, uh, similar to what we saw in BA4, BA5 while they were uh, evolving separately, sometimes they'll join each other and in terms of the similarity of, uh, of, of mutations, that's convergence there, right there, which is, which is a good sign that maybe the virus is hitting a very dead wall uh, end, and which is good. 
Uh, and so we, we, we see a stepwise accumulation of, 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 of the mutations uh, in, the, in these lineages, as you can see here uh, from B8.2, uh, uh, where we, we saw this XP, where this XPB is coming from, and we can see that uh, accumulating uh, mutations number uh, three, four mutations, five mutations, up to nine mutations from the baseline of B8.2. And these come, of course, because of the difference of these mutations and their functions, they come with difference in terms of their advantage, growth advantage, and some of them, uh, like XPB, they have a higher growth advantage uh, relative to the B8.5.2.1. Uh, so recently, uh, we saw that there was uh, a rise in XPB 1.16 in India. Uh, there was an alert, uh, an increase in these cases, thanks to the genomic surveillance continuing in that region. And also we have seen uh, recently in the US as well, uh, showing that uh, the XPB uh, 1.16 was increasing in proportion in the background of XPB.1.5. And also the recently uh, we detected here in Botswana, XBB.1.9.1, uh, 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 which we are monitoring carefully. And there's been uh, a few infections around. And the good thing is that we are not seeing a number of cases but we see that uh, this uh, kind of lineage is, uh, is associated with the massive uh, uh, yeah, immune escape. So I'll skip some of these studies, but some people have shown uh, a massive uh, uh, escape to neutralization by XPB 1.6, uh, as you can see here. And one good news is this uh, SARS-CoV-2 monoclonal antibody AZT3152 that seems to show potent neutralizing uh, um, a neutralizing historic and currently circulating variants. So I think there is some good news in the horizon uh, um, uh, as this uh, monoclonal antibody uh, advances to the next stages. And so we see that um, the boosters have been good uh, and boosting after infection, we know that it led to less increase in titers than boosting uh, they never infected because those without hybrid immunity already had high titers. So it's becoming challenging to study these immune responses, but it's good to see that uh, 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 boosters work uh, and uh, having a prior infection and, and having a booster uh, is better than natural infection alone. So no one benefits from having a natural infection alone. And we see that uh, these are also uh, uh, if effective against uh, different uh, uh, variants uh, that we, we, we see there. So we see that uh, we, 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 the variants, uh, we, no variant has uh, had made vaccines completely ineffective, uh, which is good news. Uh, and of course, the boosters are very uh, uh, powerful. And we know that the other parts of the immune system are playing a role, like the T cells, uh, that um, uh, investing our science in understanding T, T cells is going to uh, really uh, take us to the next level. Um, I'll skip this one, but we know that immunity is waning over time. So we need to uh, uh, watch, uh, uh, do more surveys, especially uh, with the uh, low boosting rates, it would be interesting to keep surveilling our environment to see whether immunity is waning uh, to certain thresholds that will allow for public health uh, uh, action. So in summary, uh, uh, with the few seconds that I left, for me, is we see that virus continues to evolve, uh, but ev there is evidence of convergent evolution. Uh, uh, continuing periodic spikes in transmission are uh, likely associated with antigenic change that we see, but these continue to be associated with the lower incidence of severe disease at death, uh, and certainly uh, uh, very few low, uh, uh, um, cases of hospitalization. We just finished a study uh, in Botswana, uh, enrolling more than 10,000 participants, uh, and we saw that the incidence of hospitalization dropped significantly uh, with uh, uh, with uh, um, uh, with uh, different uh, series of vaccination, and that was uh, beautiful to see from uh, a, a, a clinical trial. So we see that there's a complex landscape, a combination of vaccine-acquired and infection-acquired immunity from different vaccines, 
Uh, of course, makes vaccine uh, uh, studies challenging, but we need to continue to do those observational studies uh, and really report the real data. Um, so there's still some uncertainties. I wish I had a definite answer, but we still to we still need to maintain strong surveillance. We have seen good results. Um, we have seen uh, 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 good data coming out uh, from different countries in terms of uh, lowest incidence of, of SARS-CoV-2, and it's allowing a lot of people to go back to normal. But as WHO warned, it's not uh, time to think uh, COVID is gone, but we can uh, synthesize our effort and use the lessons learned uh, to, to make sure that we continue with the vaccines, uh, especially in Africa, to strengthen our basic science uh, we are already doing amazing work. We need to translate that to clinical trials and to vaccines so that we prepare on ourselves should there be any pathogen X. I would like to acknowledge uh, our colleagues that helped me put these slides together, Richard Lessos, Jonathan Lee, uh, Dr. Matsawa, uh, who was ready to step in for me because I couldn't be there physically, uh, and my colleagues and the Varans Working Group and the organizers for giving me this opportunity uh, to tackle this topic. Thank you so much.